Good evening, and welcome to Postmark's Filmwork series, Our Bridges, Stories from When. I'm Deborah Catherine, a Campbell County artist and a board member of Postmark. Our format for this series begins with a short reading from literature. Tonight's selection is Chapter 13, The Mountain Dialect from the Book of Our Southern Highlanders, written by Horace Kephart, and first published by Outing Publishing Company in the year 1913. Our author, Horace Kephart, was born in the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina on September 8th of 1862, while the American Civil War was raging. He was a librarian who became one of the most popular and well-known of the American travel and outdoor writers of the early 20th century. And now, without further ado, Horace Kephart's Adventures with the Language of Appalachia. One day I handed a volume of John Fox's stories to a neighbor and asked him to read it, being curious to learn how those vivid pictures of mountain life would impress one who was born and bred in the same atmosphere. He scanned a few lines of the dialogue, then suddenly stared at me in amazement. Oh, what's the matter with it, I asked, wondering what he could have found to startle him at the very beginning of his story. Why that feller don't know how to spell? Gravely, I explained that dialect must be spelled as it is pronounced so far as possible, or the life and savor of it would be lost. But it was of no use. My friend was outraged. That tale teller then is just making fun of the mountain people by misspelling our talk. You educated folks don't spell your own words the way you say them. A most palpable hit and it gave me a new point of view. To the mountaineers themselves, their speech is natural and proper, of course. And when they see it bared to the spotlight, 
all eyes drawn toward it by an orthography that is as odd to them as it is to us, they are stirred to wrath, just as we would be if our conversation were reported. The curse of dialect writing is elision. Still, no one can write it without using the apostrophe more than he likes to, for our highland speech is excessively clipped. Occasionally, a word is both added to and clipped from. I got a me a deck of cards. There ain't nary bitty sense in it. More interesting are our substitutions of one sound for another. In mountain dialect, Vowels may be interchanged with others. Various sounds of A are confused with E as head for had, careful, or with you, fur, rather, hair, from har, cheer, chair. Should be understood that the dialect varies a good deal from place to place. And even in the same neighborhood, we rarely hear all families speaking it alike. Outlanders who essay to write it are prone to error by making their characters speak it too consistently. It's only in the backwoods or among old people and the penned at home women that the dialect is used with any integrity. In railroad towns, we hear little of it. And farmers who trade in those towns adapt their speech somewhat to the company they may be in. The same man, at different times, may say can't and can't, set and sot, jest and jess, and gist, adder and arter and after, seed and seen, here and here, here, heard, 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 sitch, setch, took. There, there's no uniformity about it. An editor who made one or two short trips into the mountains, once wrote to me that he thought the average mountaineer's vocabulary did not exceed 300 words. This may be a natural inference if one spends but a few weeks among these people and sees them only under the prosaic conditions of workday life, but gain their intimacy, and you shall find that even the illiterates among them have a range of expression that is truly Remarkable. Seldom is a hillbilly at a loss for a word. Lacking other means of expression, there will come spang from his mouth a coinage of his own. Instantly, he will create, always from English roots of course, new words by combination or by turning nouns into verbs or otherwise interchanging the parts of speech. That barrel meet me a month. They churched pit for tail baron. Granny kept faulting us all day. Are you fixing to go squirreling? <clears throat> I wouldn't pleasure them enough to say it. I don't confidence them dogs much. We can't muscle this log up. Conversely, nouns are created from verbs. It don't make no differ. I didn't hear no give out at meeting. You can get me one more getting the wood up there. An old lady quoted to me in a plaintive quaver. It matters not. So I've been told where the body goes when the heart grows cold. But, she added, a person has a rather about where he be put. Peculiar adjectives are formed from verbs. Chair bottoming is easy setting down work. When my youngest was a little set along child, interpreted as setting along the floor, that thunderhead is the torn downest place. Them's the travelingest horses I ever seed. She's the workingest woman. 
Jim is the disabled one of the family. A verb may serve as an adverb. If I'd have been thought it enough, sometimes a conjunction is employed as a preposition. We have obliged to take care on him. These are not mere blunders, but usage is common throughout the mountains and hence real dialect. Everywhere in the mountains, we hear of biscuit bread, ham meat, rifle gun, rock cliff, riding critter, cow brute, man person, women folks, preacher man, granny woman, and neighbor people. In this category belong the famous double barrel pronouns. We all and you all in Kentucky, weans and yawns in Carolina and Tennessee. I have even heard such locution as this. Let's weans all go over to yourn's house. A double negative is so common that it may be crowded into a single word. I did it the unthoughtless of anything I ever done in my life. Triple negatives are easy. I ain't got nary none. A mountaineer can accomplish the quadruple. That boy ain't never done nothing know-how. Many other old-fashioned terms are preserved in Appalachia that sound delightfully quaint to strangers who never met them outside of books. Can buy, borrow a race of ginger? Means the un unground root. Them sorry fellers denotes scabby knaves, good for nothings. Sorry has no connection with sorrow, but literally means sore -y, covered with sores. And the Highlander sticks to its original import. When one dines in a cabin back in the hills, he will taste some strange dishes that go by still stranger names. Beans dried in the pod, then boiled, hull and all, are called leather breeches. This is not slang, but the regular name. Green beans in the pod are called snaps. When shelled, they are called shock beans. If one is especially fond of a certain dish, he declares that he's a fool about it. I'm a plum fool about pickle beans. Conversely, I ain't much of a fool about liver is rather more than a hint of distaste. I et me a bait literally means a beer snack. What the mountaineers call hemlock is the shrub leucotho. The hemlock tree is named spruce pine, while spruce is he balsam. Balsam itself is she balsam. Laurel is ivy, and rhododendron is laurel. In some places, pine needles are called twinkles, and the locust insect is known as a feral. A treetop left on the ground after logging is called the lap. Sobby wood means soggy or sodden, and the verb is to sob. Evening in the mountains begins at noon instead of at sunset. Spell is used in the sense of while, a good spell afterwards, and soon for early, a soon start in the morning. The hillsmen say, a year come June, Thursday, twas a week ago, and the year 19 and 8. A mountaineer does not throw a stone. He flings a rock. He sharpens tools on a grinding rock or wet rock. Tomato, cabbage, molasses, and baking powder are used always as plural nouns. Pass me them molasses. 
I'll have a few more of them cabbage. How many bacon powders have you got? The speech of the Southern Highlanders is alive with quaint idioms. I swapped horses, and I'll tell you for why. Your name ain't much common. Who's got to beat? You think me of it in the morning. I ought to go to town tomorrow. The woman's aiming to go to meeting. I had in head to plow today, but hits come on to rain. I've laid off and laid off to fix that fence. When the mountaineer is drawn out of his natural reserve and allows his emotions free reign, there are few educated people who can match his picturesque and pungent diction. His trick of apt phrasing is intuitive. His characterization is quick and vivid. Whether he uses quaint, obsolete English or equally delightful perversions, what he says will go straight to the mark. The writer recalls with pleasure not only the features, but the mere titles of that superb landscape that he shared with the wild creatures and a few woodsmen when living far up on the divide of the Great Smoky Mountains. I was so pleased when I first stumbled on this book because it has so many things throughout it that reminded me of my daily life right here in Campbell County and especially when I first arrived here. This particular chapter makes me think of the, the very different ways that people speak English all over the United States much less in other countries where the native language is English too. I've met folk from England who are convinced that no American really speaks English at all. It does make me laugh to think how often those of us who speak the same language have no idea what each other are saying. Which reminds me of my first drive down Highway 75. First, I go through Kentucky, lots of hills, and getting into Tennessee, I pass Stinking Creek, then a little further on down, the Devil's Racetrack, then I come upon Butter and Egg Road. Well, by that time, I was so hungry, I thought, well, there's got to be a restaurant here somewhere, so I stopped and asked the uh, first man that I saw on the street, and he looks at me and he says, Yankee. Well, I was a little taken aback, and then he said, well, set a spell, darling. Sweetheart, we would like you to come to our church. So then I uh, was by that time uh, ready to set a spell, so I said to him, well, can you direct me to a, a local restaurant that you like to go to or something that's good? And he looks at me straight in the eye and he says, hats on or hats off? Well, 
at that point, I fell in love. No need for a uniform, no need for special clothes. This was where I wanted to be. And the longer I'm here, the more it reminds me of the values and the communication that we all want to achieve in our families and with others. People here are so kind and generous. The picturesqueness of everything that, that has come upon me here and the friendliness of the people. I go into a grocery store and I'm greeted with sweetheart and darling. Reminds me of my years growing up. My father always stood up when any lady entered the room. And when I would go to visit my grandmother, my father always respectfully stood up and called him, called her Mrs. Lohman. He never would call her granny or mother. It was always Mrs. Lohman. And my grandmother had a background not too different from some of the people here. Her family was originally English, as many of the people are in Campbell County. And the way she spoke made me feel right at home here. She would say, it don't matter none, or you dasn't dare do that. And she would have a little saying for whatever was going on. Children should be seen and not heard. A stitch in time saves nine. Idle hands make a devil's workshop. And my favorite, which I use to this day, mind the pennies and the dollars take care of themselves. She had a small tin bank that was shaped like a Civil War drum. It was red and blue with yellowish trim. And she kept it on the top of her china cabinet. But when she put it up there, she had to do it herself because it had to go in upside down because it was missing the little tin flap where the coins fall out. It had that, so she would put the hole on the top. And if I would try to go near it, she would again say, you dasn't do that. How universal it is to be reminded that our local customs are based on small observances and that we can read something from the early 1900s or the mid 1900s and still have it be relevant to today. How we communicate with each other is something that, that we all need to think about. And I'm particularly concerned about it today because I get text messages with spelling, the letter U instead of Y-O-U, or the letter R instead of A-R-E. And when I have people visiting, they never seem to look up from their, their tablets or, or iPhones or, or whatever their, their devices are called to actually look me in the face straight on and have a conversation. But in Campbell County, there are no strangers. Everyone is hospitable at all times, and that's what I love about it. Well, now that you've heard some of my words and stories about Campbell County, now's the time when I need to point out to you as the storytellers of your own lives and your families and your acquaintances in this region, that this program, Our Bridges, Stories From When, is about our stories, meaning your stories, not just mine as the reader. So now I invite you to share a story or a letter or moment from your life and family and friends and acquaintances and church and strangers that you thought about while I was reading a section of the Mountain Dialect from Horace Keppert's Our Southern Highlanders. Maybe you thought of a time when you just could not understand what someone was trying to tell you. Or a time that no matter how hard you tried, you could not make yourself understood by somebody else. Maybe you had an older relative who immigrated to the United States from another country and struggled with English. 
Maybe you thought of something else entirely. Maybe you have some quaint or funny stories or special local sayings that you have heard that you would be willing to share with us. Maybe you thought of something that I haven't thought of or mentioned and it's really your own unique story. This is an area of tales, of storytelling, and it's a vocal, oral tradition here. And that's what makes it so special. And we want to meet and talk to the people telling the stories, meet them face to face and hear the way they are telling us what has happened in their lives. On the last Wednesday of this month, March 30th at 8.30 p.m., right here on WLAF Channel 12 in La Follette, we will be sharing the stories you tell. We have asked a few friends of Postmark to respond, but we always have room for more, and we want to hear your stories and to share them. The way to get in touch will be on the screen in just a minute. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Postmarks, Our Bridges, Stories from When. I'm Deborah Catherine, looking forward to seeing you again and wishing you a good night and good memories and joyful use of words. Thank you.